My name is Brenda, and welcome to Horrifying History, where you will hear about the unexplained, paranormal, and supernatural happenings that has stained the pages of history. Last episode, we took a look at the Whitechapel murders, aka Jack the Ripper's murders. These have been an enigma for many since the Victorian age. The mystery surrounding the identity of this famous serial killer has become complex as the murders are themselves, and today, the London police as well as people from around the world still wonder who was Jack the Ripper. Once again, my dear listeners, we are going to be talking about murder and graphic crime scenes. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Episode 72, Jack the Ripper, Part 2. The number of Jack the Ripper suspects is actually quite astounding. In fact, the number runs well over 100 people. But some of these are actual contenders for the title of Jack the Ripper, while others border on the ridiculous. Every year, more and more books come out claiming that that author finally cracked this case wide open and they solved this historical mystery. Some of these books do unearth pieces of information which results in just another thing to ponder, but sadly, many twist the facts to fit their own narrative versus demonstrating how it actually stands up against the known facts of this case. In the beginning of the Ripper's crime spree, police believed that these crimes were committed by local gangs, and this is why they originally started focusing on what was called the High Rip Gang. During these times, the gang problem was considered to be out of control. The world was changing quickly, and especially in the bigger cities like London. Immigrants flooded in, which caused a mixing of different religions and ethnic groups who were all just trying to find their way in a new world. Meanwhile, criminals quickly figured out that a life of crime was a lot easier if they worked with like-minded people, so street gangs began to form, and soon they started staking out their claim to what they thought was their part of the city. And one of these gangs was the High Rip Gang. This group stalked the streets of Liverpool during the 1880s and were considered to be very dangerous. With their power peaking between 1884 and 1886, the High Rip Gang spread their reach through the poorest areas of London. Their victims were mostly sailors, dock workers, and shopkeepers. Those that the gang did not kill were often beaten to a point of disfigurement and near death. This gang's calling card was to beat people with heavy belts and knives, which were known as bleeders. The High Rip Gang was very well organized and completely ruthless. Gang members were always heavily armed, so much so that police during this time usually let them do what they wanted rather than risk a confrontation. While this gang's activity started to decrease after 1886, they still lingered through the rest of the decade. Even though their power was diminishing, there was a general consensus that the Whitechapel murders was done by one of the area gangs. In an article that was in the Liverpool Mercury dated September 3, 1888, they speculated if the killings were possibly influenced by the High Rip Gang, which placed the possibility in the minds of their readers. But by early September, the police had already come to the conclusion that if somebody from the local gangs were responsible, the public panic caused by these murders would have led one of the gang members to inform on the guilty party, and since that did not happen, the police ruled them out. By the time of Annie Chapman's murder on September 8, 1888, the police decided that they were looking for a lone killer. The police did have some clues at the time of what kind of man Jack the Ripper was. Firstly, there was a great amount of speculation that the Ripper showed some amount of medical knowledge or an understanding of human anatomy. This is why police began to look into several medical students who spent some time in asylums. But this became a dead end when the police discovered that the students had alibis for the times of the crimes. While many believed that Jack showed a knowledge of the human body, other people disagreed. Many others believe that the killer did not show medical skills in the kills and basically had the same knowledge of a butcher or somebody who slaughtered animals. So the police investigated this avenue too. After carrying out extensive inquiries amongst the numerous local butcher and slaughterhouses, this had the same results as the other theory. 
all the alibis for the times of the murders for those suspects checked out, and the police were back to the drawing board. The next theory was Jack the Ripper must have lived in the area where the murders occurred. This was because of how well the killer seemed to know the area and how he was able to avoid getting caught. Over 2,000 interviews was carried out by London police officers, with over 300 people being investigated. Of those 300, 80 people were actually detained in police custody. It was entirely possible that one of these people was Jack the Ripper, but none of the interviews, investigations, or detentions was able to give police any concrete evidence. Once again, Jack was able to slip out of the police's grasp. Ever since the Whitechapel murders, suspect after suspect has been put forth as being Jack the Ripper. Some of these border on the ridiculous, like for example, the Freemasons. Others were originally police suspects and discarded, but modern researchers put them back on the list. But for today's episode, we're going to look at some of the more popular suspects, and while you listen, I want you guys to decide if any is likely Jack the Ripper. The first on our list is a man named Aaron Kosminski. Aaron was born on September 11, 1865, as a son of a tailor and his wife. It is said that he may have been employed in a hospital as either a hairdresser or an orderly for a short time before he emigrated from Poland in either 1880 or 1881. It is not known why Aaron chose to leave Poland, but many people speculate it could be because many other Polish Jews emigrated during this time, due to the riots that were occurring that was targeting the Polish Jews after the assassination of Tsar Alexander II. After moving to London, Aaron started working as a barber in Whitechapel, which became the home to many Jewish immigrants. It is said that he worked only sporadically and that he possibly relied on his family's financial support. On July 12, 1890, Aaron was put in the Mile End Old Town workhouse due to his worsening mental state, and he was released three days later after his brother certified his entry. On February 4, 1881, Aaron was returned back to the workhouse, and then on February 7, he was transferred to the Colony Hatch Lunatic Asylum after Aaron allegedly threatened his sister with a knife. Aaron remained incarcerated for the next three years until he was transferred to the Levinston Asylum on April 19, 1894. Documentation during this time tells that Aaron was actually mentally ill since at least 1885. They said that he had auditory hallucinations, a paranoid fear of being fed by other people that caused him to pick up and eat food that was thrown out, and that he refused to wash and bathe. This documentation also lists the cause of his mental illness as self-abuse, which at that time was an indirect way of saying he was touching himself too much. Due to his paranoid fear of food though, it is said that Aaron was extremely thin. He was so much so that when he died in March of 1919, it is said he weighed only 96 pounds or 44 kilograms. So why is Aaron on our list? In the years after the murders, documents came to light that revealed that police suspected a man that they referred to as Kosminski. In a memo that was written in 1894 by Sir Melville McNaughton, who was the assistant chief constable of the London Metro Police, it names one of their suspects as a Polish Jew named Kosminski. In this memo, it states there were many reasons why they suspected Aaron, and these included that he had a hatred of women and a strong homicidal tendency. In addition to this, Chief Inspector Donald Swanson, who was the man who led the Ripper investigation, names a man named Kosminski in his handwritten notes that were in the margins of his presentation copy of Assistant Commissioner Sir Robert Anderson's memoirs. He also added that Kosminski has been watched at his brother's home in Whitechapel by the police and that he was taken with his hands tied behind his back to the workhouse. He was then moved to the asylum where he died afterwards. Now, during the time of the murders, Aaron allegedly lived either on Providence Street or Greenfield Street, which both were near the location of the murders. But just because somebody lives in the area, it doesn't make a person a murderer. But DNA might. 
In March of 2019, a DNA forensic investigation was published in the Journal of Forensic Science. It identified Aaron as the likely killer. How? Well, the study's authors conducted genetic testing of blood and semen that was found on a shawl near the body of Catherine Eddowes, who was Jack the Ripper's fourth victim. This silk shawl was the only piece of physical evidence that is known to be associated with the murders. Through analysis of fragments of both the victim's and the suspect's microchondrial DNA, which is passed down only through one's maternal line, researchers were able to compare those samples from other samples taken from both living descendants of Catherine and Aaron. The blood, it matches Catherine's distant relatives and the semen while it matches Aaron's. So many of you guys are likely thinking right now that this is an open and shut case. Well, it's not. Many people can share the same mtDNA signature, and the one linked to Aaron is a very common subtype. Therefore, unless the DNA signature can be narrowed down to a rarer subtype, or additional evidence can be found, it's not even close to a slam dunk. There is also the question of the scarf's history. It was open to contamination for decades, and it's not clear if it was left by Catherine or her killer. Then, there is the fact that even though it was Catherine's, she may have been with Aaron previously for her occupation and not as a victim. Lastly, there is the fact that Aaron doesn't match the descriptions of the killer from contemporary witnesses. He was a young man with slight build, and people report the killer as being an older man with a heavier build. Sadly, the main reason Aaron has been on this list of suspects was because of references to his last name in police documents, but that doesn't mean he actually did it. The next on our list is a man who was named Montague John Druitt, who was the favorite suspect of the Assistant Commissioner of the London Metro Police. Montague was a barrister, and he supplemented his income working as an assistant schoolmaster at a boarding school in southeast London. In documents written by the assistant commissioner, he listed three suspects with Montague being at the very top. He was described as, and I quote, a doctor about 41 years of age and of fairly good family, who disappeared at the time of the Miller Court's murder, and whose body was found floating in the Thames on 31st December, i.e. seven weeks after the said murder. The body was said to have been in the water for a month or more. From private information, I have little doubt, but that his own family suspected this man of being the Whitechapel murderer. It was alleged that he was sexually insane. Montague was born in August of 1857 and came from an upper middle class background. He was the second son to a prominent local surgeon, William Druitt, and his wife, Anne. Montague was well-educated and he excelled at cricket where he met and befriended many influential people. But it was his older brother's influence that pushed him towards a career in the law. It is said that during these times, one in eight barristers was able to make a living from the law, and this was because only the wealthy could afford to take legal action. While some of Montague's biographers allege that his practice did not flourish, others allege that it provided him a relatively substantial income based on the value of his estate at his death. But what is known for sure was he did supplement his income working as an assistant schoolmaster at a boarding school. On Friday, November 30th, 1888, Montague was fired from his job at the school for reasons that are unclear. One newspaper at the time quoted his brother William's testimony at the inquest into Montague's death as saying that Montague was dismissed because he got in serious trouble. What the trouble was, we don't know. Then in early December, Montague disappeared. On December 21st, 1888, his Cricket Club's minute book records that Montague was removed as treasurer and secretary because they believed that he'd gone abroad. Then on December 31st, his body was discovered floating in the River Thames. The stones that Montague loaded his pockets with kept his body submerged for over a month. Some modern scholars speculate that Montague was fired and subsequently killed himself due to it was discovered that he was a homosexual or he had relations with underage boys. Since a large amount of money was found on the body, these scholars believe that it was possible he was using this money to pay off a blackmailer. But 
Others point out that there is no evidence of Montague's sexual orientation or preferences, but there is evidence that he possibly suffered from a hereditary psychiatric illness. Montague's mother suffered from depression, and she was institutionalized from 1888 to her death in 1890. His maternal grandmother was declared insane and committed suicide, as did his aunt and his eldest sister. The main reason, though, that people believed that Montague was actually mentally ill was due to a note that was found in his room addressed to his brother William. It read in part, and I quote, Since Friday, I felt that I was going to be like mother, and the best thing for me was to die. So what triggered this? Could it be that he was being blackmailed due to his sexual orientation or preference? Or maybe, was it something darker? Could it be that he could no longer live with the guilt of being a serial killer? Well, maybe. But why do people believe that Montague was the killer? Shortly after the body of Mary Kelly was discovered, rumors started that Jack the Ripper drowned in the Thames. Then, in February of 1891, the Member of Parliament for West Dorset announced that Jack the Ripper was the son of a surgeon who committed suicide on the night of his last murder. Although the MP did not name a suspect, the description he gave matches Montague. Assistant Chief Constable Sir Melville McNaughton named Montague as a suspect in a handwritten private memo. He highlighted the coincidence between Montague's disappearance and death shortly after the last murder and claimed to have private information that left him little doubt that Montague's family believed he was Jack the Ripper. So looking at all of this, we have several problems with this theory. Firstly, there's no proof that Montague actually did anything. Just because he committed suicide a short time after the last murder, it doesn't mean he's actually connected to those murders. Even though his father was a surgeon, it doesn't mean that Montague learned those skills, and just because his residence was near Whitechapel, it doesn't mean he was the killer. Lastly, because he had mental health issues, it also does not mean he was Jack the Ripper. And then there was the cricket match. On the day of Annie's murder, Montague was playing cricket in Blackheath, and on the day that Elizabeth and Catherine were killed, he was in West County defending a client in a court case. He was a fair distance away from where the murders took place. Is it possible he traveled there by rail? Well, it is, but it's highly unlikely that he could have traveled that far in bloodstained clothes unnoticed, unless he hid a new set of clothes nearby or perhaps brought them with him but in none of the descriptions of the killer did they say he carried a bag. The next man on our list is a man named Walter Sickert, who was linked to these murders by several authors through the years, but his role, it seems to vary. According to some, Walter was an accomplice, and others say he only knew who Jack the Ripper was. But according to crime novelist Patricia Cornwell in her 2002 book, Portrait of a Killer, Jack the Ripper case closed, Walter was Jack the Ripper. When Cornwell started to look into who Jack was, she set out to do something that nobody else had, to apply modern forensic techniques to the case. When her book was published, it caused a huge sensation when she said in an interview she believed Walter was the killer. Walter Sickert was a German-born painter and printmaker who was born in 1860. He was a member of the Camden Town group of post-impressionist artists in early 20th century London, and it is said that he was a very important influence on British styles of avant-garde art. He was considered to be an eccentric who favored ordinary people and urban scenery as his subjects. He is considered to be a very prominent figure in the transition of Impressionism to the Modernism movement. But it was said that Walter was very interested in the crimes of Jack the Ripper. In fact, it was said he lodged in a room used by the killer, and he was told this by his former landlady who suspected one of her previous lodgers. Walter created a painting of this room, and he named it Jack the Ripper's Bedroom, which shows a dark room with most details hidden. For years after the murders, no one brought up Walter's name at all, but then in the 1970s, authors began to explore the possibility that Walter was the killer or maybe his accomplice. In the 1976 book called Jack the Ripper, The Final Solution by Stephen Knight, he said that Walter was forced into being the Ripper's accomplice. Knight said that his information came from a man named Joseph Gorman, who claimed to be Walter's illegitimate son, 
but Joseph later admitted it was all a hoax. Then came even more books, which made the same allegations, but it wasn't until Patricia Cornwell's book that Walter was named as the killer. Why? Well, according to Cornwell's theory, Walter was made impotent by a series of painful operations in his childhood for a fistula on his penis. Being impotent scarred him emotionally and left him with a pathological hatred for women. This drove him into becoming Jack the Ripper. But as with the previous theories, there are holes. For example, the hospital where Walter had his surgeries specialized in rectal versus genitalia fistulas. Also, evidence shows that he was not impotent since his first wife cited his adultery in her petition for divorce. In addition to this, it is believed he had several mistresses and was thought to have fathered at least one illegitimate child. Concerning his supposed pathological hatred of women, Cornwell cites a series of Walter's paintings that were inspired by a murder of a prostitute in 1908. She said that these works bear a striking resemblance to the post-mortem photos of Ripper victims. To prove her point, Cornwell purchased 31 of Walter's paintings and some in the art world allege that she destroyed one in the search for his DNA. Cornwell denies this and claims that she was scientifically able to prove that mitochondrial DNA from one of the Ripper letters sent to Scotland Yard matches the MT DNA from a letter written by Walter. She also said that this MT DNA matches only 1% of the population. Then in 2007, Cornwell published another book called Ripper, The Secret Life of Walter Sickert, in which she said she uncovered even further evidence. But in 2019, an article from the Journal of the American Association for the Advancement of Science stated that Patricia Cornwell's allegations that were based on the DNA studies of those letters were faked. While there is no doubt that Walter was fascinated with murder and crime, there is definitely no proof that he was a killer. Firstly, there is evidence that suggests he wasn't even in England during these murders. Although some people suggest that he could have traveled into Whitechapel to commit the crimes, there is no evidence to prove that he did. Also, Cornwell contends that Walter was responsible for writing most of the Ripper letters, but experts concerning this case, as well as the police at the time, did not believe that any of the letters were from the Ripper. They were all hoaxes. It also has been proven that the letters vary greatly in their grammatical structure, spelling, and handwriting, which makes it impossible that one person wrote them all. And then there was the DNA study. If the study was not faked, it still doesn't prove that Walter was guilty. Critics have pointed out that in DNA comparisons that focus on MT DNA, MT DNA profiles can be shared by one to 10% of the population. This means that the DNA in question was not unique to Walter. As with our other suspects, it has not yet been proven that Walter was Jack the Ripper. So now that we looked at some of the more popular suspects, let's look at some of the conspiracy-based ones. One of these was first explored in a book by Stephen Knight. In his 1976 book called Jack the Ripper, The Final Solution, Knight proposed that the Ripper murders were done as a cover-up. Now, most experts dismiss this theory as complete propaganda, and this book's conclusions is now widely discredited. But even so, this book was commercially successful. It was also the base of a graphic novel series and a film called From Hell, and is said to be one of the inspirations for Patricia Cornwell. So what is this conspiracy theory and how did it start? In 1970, Thomas E. A. Stowell published an article called Jack the Ripper, A Solution in a November issue of a UK crime magazine called The Criminologist. In this article, Stowell suggested that Jack the Ripper was actually an aristocrat who contacted syphilis during a trip to the West Indies. It drove him insane and that this man committed all the murders. Although Stowell did not directly name his suspect, he did describe his physical appearance, his nicknames, and his family. All of these descriptions pointed to Queen Victoria's grandson, Prince Albert Victor. Stowell further wrote that after his suspect committed a double murder on September 30, 1888, the suspect was captured by his own family and placed in an institution in the southern region of England. But 
the suspect managed to escape to commit a final murder on November 9th before dying of syphilis. To prove his theory, Stowell compared the mutilation of the Ripper victims to the disembowelment of deer shot by those of high class on their estates. Stowell claimed that he got his information from the private notes of a man named Sir William Gull, who was a physician who treated members of the royal family. So as you can imagine, this gathered a lot of attention and placed the prince on the list of Ripper suspects. But soon, the prince's innocence was quickly proven. Dr. Gall had died before the prince, which made it impossible for him to be the source of the information. Also, there were three doctors who attended the prince at his death. All three were in agreement that Albert Victor died of pneumonia. Considering the time that syphilis takes to progress, it was also extremely improbable that the prince had this disease. To match the time frames that this disease takes to develop, it would mean that the prince was infected at the age of approximately nine years old, which was six years before the prince traveled to the West Indies. Also, during the time frame that the prince was supposedly in a mental institution, he was serving in the British military and he was making regular public appearances. Furthermore, official documents show that during the time of the murders, Albert Victor was either attending a public function or meeting with foreign royalty hundreds of miles away from London. Now, even though Stowell's ideas were completely wrong, it stoked interest in this case. A few years later, in 1973, the BBC released a TV series which investigated the Whitechapel murders. This docudrama, called Jack the Ripper, featured some real evidence with fiction added in. This series was later made into a book called The Ripper File in 1975 by Elwyn Jones and John Lloyd. That included testimony by a name that you guys probably remember from earlier, Joseph Gorman. Joseph, who had called himself Joseph Sickert, claimed he was the illegitimate son of painter Walter Sickert. He said that his supposed father, Walter, told him that it was actually the royal family physician, Sir William Gall, who committed the Jack the Ripper murders with the help of accomplices. Why? Well, Joseph Gorman claimed that his Catholic grandmother had secretly married Prince Albert Victor, which made his mother the rightful heir to the throne. He said that the Ripper murders were staged as a part of a conspiracy to hide any scandal by killing anybody who knew of his mother's birth. When Knight heard of this tale, he decided to use this as a basis of his novel in 1976. So as the story goes, Gorman alleged that Prince Albert Victor's mother, Prince Alexandria, introduced Walter Sickert to her son, wanting Sickert to teach her son art. But soon, the prince met one of Walter's models, Annie Elizabeth Crook, and they immediately fell in love. The prince and the young Catholic girl started an affair, and they married in secret, with both Sickert and Annie's friend Mary Kelly acting as witnesses. Soon afterwards, the couple had their first child together, who was Joseph's mother, Alice Margaret Crook, on April 18, 1885. It was about this time that Joseph alleged that the prince settled Annie and the baby Alice in an apartment on Cleveland Street. By April of 1888, Queen Victoria and Prime Minister Lord Salisbury discovered the prince's secret. So according to Joseph, Salisbury ordered a raid on the apartment because he was afraid that if the public found out that the prince married a Catholic girl and had a child, that a Catholic heir to the throne would cause a revolution. Supposedly, the royal family put the prince in custody, while Sir William Gall certified Annie as insane before having her locked away in an asylum. She would spend the next 30 years before her death in and out of institutions. With the baby's parents out of the picture, Joseph alleged it was Mary Kelly that was looking after baby Alice. She was happy to hide the child, but according to Joseph, she and her friends, Mary Ann Nichols, Annie Chapman, and Elizabeth Stride, decided to use this to their advantage and blackmail the government. Joseph said that Salisbury was a Freemason, and with his fellow Freemasons, they staged the murders of all these women as a way to hide this scandal. According to this tale, it was Dr. Gull who killed the women with the help of his coachman, John Netley, and Sir Robert Anderson, who was the assistant commissioner of Scotland Yard. 
Joseph further claimed that Catherine Eddowes was killed by accident since she was using the name Mary Kelly as an alias and the killers thought mistakenly that she was the Mary Kelly caring for the baby. Now speaking of this baby, Joseph claimed that they tried to kill her twice, but they were unsuccessful. When she grew up, Joseph said that his mother became Walter Sickert's mistress and that Alice and Walter were his biological parents. But as you guys may remember, Joseph later recanted his story. Sickert was not in London when Joseph was conceived. Joseph Gorman was one of five children born during the marriage of Alice Crook and William Gorman. Now concerning Alice's parentage, her father's name is not on her birth certificate, but she claimed her father was a man named William Crook, who just happened to be the name of her own grandfather. Experts speculate the reason that the father's name was left blank was due to she was a result of an incestuous relationship between her mother, Annie, and her grandfather, William. Now, others believe this was because she was illegitimate. But either way, if she was somehow related to the royal family, being illegitimate would have taken her out of line of succession. It seems, though, that the truth did not stand in the way of Knight writing a bestseller. Thank you all for joining me for our latest episode of Horrifying History. Who do you think Jack the Ripper was? Join us on Facebook at Horrifying History, on Instagram at Horrifying underscore History, on Twitter at Horrifying H-I-S-T-1, or reach out to us by email at HorrifyingHistory at Outlook.com and let us know who you think the killer was. Now personally, after researching this episode, I've come to one conclusion. There just isn't a smoking gun here. Everything is pure speculation, and because of this, I'm not sure if we'll ever know who Jack the Ripper actually was. I've been asked by you guys what is the best way you can support this show. Now, the best way is by hitting that subscribe button for my podcast and by giving us a five-star review with your podcast provider. With each subscribe button hit and by giving us that review, you let more and more people know about our show. The added bonus is that when you hit that subscribe button, you will automatically download our next episode on its day of release. It's a great way not to miss our next episode, Legendary Sea Monsters. Also, if you would love to take home a piece of horrifying history, you need to check out our store. You will find some great items by going to www.redbubble.com and by searching for horrifying history in their search box. Thank you all for listening again today, and until next time.